Hi there, everybody. Welcome. We're glad to have you join us today to learn more about and go deeper with the evidence-based practices in the Mass Literacy Guide. I'm Donna Goldstein, an ELA content lead at DESE. Mass Literacy Getting Started is a series of six sessions designed to support users in accessing specific areas of the Mass Literacy Guide. Today is our third in the six session series. Each session features experienced educators speaking directly to their use of evidence-based practices and connecting this work to the Mass Literacy Guide. Today's focus area is around fluent word reading. The remaining three focus areas include language comprehension, students experiencing reading difficulties, and leading a multi-tiered system of support. A link to a central doc with registration for the upcoming sessions and all of the resources being shown today is being dropped in the chat for you now. As you know, like I just mentioned a moment ago, this session is being recorded. You can find today's recording within a week or so on the Mass Literacy Guide landing page under the top resources section here. Uh, these recordings, excuse me, as well as all previous mass literacy webinar recordings are, can all be found in this top resources section. If you have a question, please use the question and answer feature. We will be monitoring that throughout today's presentation and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. A page with a sequential list of all the resource titles and links referenced in today's presentation, including the top resources section where the video will be posted, was just dropped in the chat. This page also includes all of the links our featured speaker will reference today. We'll start today with a brief introduction and overview of today's focus area, while most of the time will be spent with our featured speaker, Jennifer Hogan. After Jen presents, we'll have some question and answer time, which will be moderated by my DESE colleague, Susan Kazeroid. For those of you who are new to the Mass Literacy Guide, it is a statewide effort to empower educators with the evidence-based practices for literacy that all students need. Evidence-based instruction provided within schools that are culturally responsive and sustaining will put our youngest students on the path toward literacy for life. As part of this work, over the next several years, DESE will offer early literacy programming support, excuse me, early literacy programming paired with implementation supports including resources, professional development, and grants. You're looking at a screenshot of the Mass Literacy landing page. We have a great video featuring classroom teachers, specialists, and a couple of the researchers who advised on this work. Lots of voices, perspectives, and areas of expertise contributed. The featured speakers in this video were among the 100 plus stakeholders who advised. We engaged with researchers from across the country and internationally, along with Massachusetts preschool and elementary teachers, administrators, and education preparation faculty. DESE also partnered with the Massachusetts Reading Association and collaborated with the Mass Association of School Administrators, specifically working with a group of assistant superintendents. You can see the Mass Reading Association logo right down at the bottom corner of the landing page there. In terms of layout, the Mass Literacy Guide is made up of five primary sections that are all accessible via this landing page. The five sections include components of the core literacy block, which is the first one right here, the teacher table, skills for early reading, students experiencing reading difficulties, leading a multi-tier system of support, and pathway to equity in early literacy. And all areas of the guide can also be accessed using the left-hand navigation over here. As mentioned during the welcome, the focus for today's session is fluent word reading. The set of skills involved in supporting fluent word reading, and I'm, I'm so sorry, excuse me. As mentioned during the welcome, 
The focus of today's section is fluent word reading. The set of skills involved in supporting the development of fluent word reading is supported in several areas across the Mass Literacy Guide. But today, we'll be making connections specifically in this area, skills for early reading. Our featured speaker, Jennifer Hogan, a reading specialist from Lynn Public Schools, will be sharing her experience with evidence-based literacy instruction to support fluent word reading in just a few minutes. The resources and information she will speak to are all connected to this skills for early reading section. So here is a look at the skills for early reading landing page. And this section identifies the skills that contribute to early reading proficiency and is organized around the simple view of reading. And at this link right here, there is information about the simple view of reading. In brief, the simple view of reading is a cognitively based theory that asserts in order to learn to read, children must develop both fluent word reading and language comprehension. These two factors, fluent word reading and language comprehension, account for the variance in reading ability in young children. The theory has held up over many years and in many studies. As you might remember if you joined us last week when we had Jen Traverso as our featured speaker, we did spend some time at the language comprehension side of the simple view, specifically here around knowledge. Today, the practices to support fluent word reading that Jen Hogan will discuss are all over here on the orange side of the graphic in the fluent word reading section. And they include phonological awareness, including phonemic awareness, phonics and decoding, and automatic word recognition. Please note that next week's session will dive back into the blue language comprehension side of the graphic. So with this little bit of background in mind, let's get ready to meet today's featured speaker. We are so pleased to have Jennifer Hogan here to share about her evidence-based practice supporting fluent word reading. Jen is an elementary literacy specialist with Lynn Public Schools. She has developed and taught professional development around evidence-based practices with teaching reading and is continually working to improve her instruction to align with the evidence base for how children learn to read. Jen served as a literacy champion one of about 50 educators, primarily teachers and some administrators from across the Commonwealth that were deeply involved in advising Desi about the Mass Literacy Guide. She has so much to share with us today and we really appreciate her time and her expertise. So welcome, Jen. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to share yours. After Jen is finished presenting, we will continue along with some question and answer time with Jen and my colleague, Susan Kazeroid from DESE. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. What an introduction that was. I will share my screen very quickly. The typical Zoom, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. All right, so as Donna said, my name is Jen Hogan. I first, before we start, just wanna thank Donna and Susan and Catherine for having me today. It's such an honor to be here, especially all of you. It's such a nice day outside, so I really appreciate you joining me today. Just as Donna said, some of my background, I am an elementary reading specialist in the Lynn Public Schools. I work primarily with the early literacy grades. Um, I'm gonna combine the next two bullets a little bit, but I wanna give kudos to some of my colleagues on here who started the North Shore Leadership Series last year, which I was able to attend. And that was an aha moment for me and kind of what got me started jumping into what people have now called the science of reading and this new evidence base. The first time I attended that conference, uh, Emily Hanford came to speak. And if you're not familiar with her, she's an education journalist through, um, NPR, and I've linked a couple of her articles that she's done in her podcast in the document. So if you have a chance, give her a listen. She's really compelling in the way that she speaks. And she had me hooked from the first minute. And I remember sitting with my colleagues, looking at them and saying, how did we not know this? I can't believe it. And from there, I just dedicated my time to trying to improve myself to better serve my students. 
As Donna said, I was a literacy champion last year and I had the ability to give input on the math literacy guide and to be grouped in with a group of people with such amazing minds like that was incredible. And to be able to work on this guide and really make it so that it's useful for teachers because I am a public school teacher and I know we all need stuff that's accessible, that's easy. And so that was a great experience to be able to bridge the gap between the research and our practice because right now that gap still exists. And my elementary school this year, we wrote and then we were able to receive the early grades literacy grant through DESE, which is incredible. Uh, the goal of that grant is to use evidence-based practices to improve early literacy instruction through some professional development. So that's been a great experience to be able to really refine our knowledge and build our knowledge base around some of these practices with my colleagues. And we've been able to dig into this guide and start pulling it apart and applying it to our instruction. As Donna showed you, this is the landing page when you go to the Mass Literacy Guide and visit the Skills for Early Reading page. We are going to focus mostly on this left side today, but I don't want to negate the importance of the side on the right for reading on the whole, but we're going to focus on the fluent word reading. And just to bring your attention, if you're familiar with the Scarborough's Reading Rope, this graphic is a really nice visual representation of Scarborough's Reading Rope and how those strands intertwine to build proficient readers. We're going to focus today on three kinds of buckets, so phonological awareness, phonics and decoding, and automatic word recognition. And really how those first two, phonological awareness and building a structured phonics routine, funnel themselves into automatic word recognition, which is really the goal. That's what we want all of our students to be able to do, right, is be able to look at the word and automatically read it. And that's how we're going to build that fluent word reading. With that being said, we're going to start off with phonological awareness. I'll take you through some of the places that I think are the most useful in the guide that I've been able to use in my instruction and then how I apply them into my teaching. We'll start with phonological awareness. I have to say I changed this quote maybe 10 times because David Kilpatrick has so many great quotes that I think are so compelling. But this one here, poor, phon poor phonological awareness is the most common cause of poor reading. When I first read that, when I read David Kilpatrick's book, it really humbled me because I did not know this. And we know I'm a Title I reading interventionist and us as teachers, we're always so up against time. I'm always running out of time. There's never enough time in the day. And so phonological awareness was really the first thing that I would cut out of my lesson. You know, I wanted to get to the phonics. I wanted to get to the reading. I wanted to get to the writing. So this just had to go, you know, something's got to give. And I think that's the case for a lot of us as we try to keep all of the balls in the air. But after reading some of this evidence and this science, I now not only do I not cut it, but I'm trying to focus on it more because of what the research tells us. So for phonological awareness, we want to keep that instruction consistent from grades K to three and maybe even higher if the students need it. Just a reminder that there's no print. If we're really gonna teach phonological awareness authentically, then we're not going to use any print at all with our students. And we're gonna move from phonological awareness at the word syllable rhyme level, which we'll talk about into more advanced phonemic activities. And there are some wonderful videos on the Mass Literacy Guide that actually show all of this in action. So I definitely recommend checking them out. It helps me kind of frame how I would run my lesson, how long it would last and how quick some of this can be. So those videos are great. I'm gonna credit Melissa Orkin with these following slides here. I had the opportunity and really the privilege to hear her speak through our work with the Early Grades Literacy Grant. And I am going to try, but I know I won't do her justice right now. So if you ever get the chance to listen to Melissa Orkin speak, I learned so much from her. We just had an institute with her just last week. And every time she speaks, I learn something new. So these slides are coming from her. And what these are, are the developmental progression of phonological awareness skills. So what I'm talking about when I say move from phonological to phonemic. And... What happens is we move from this word level, so rhyming, alliteration, and syllables into this basic phonemic awareness, where I find that even for me and my colleagues, we kind of get stuck here. And I think that's because some of the screeners we use focus on this. So we see a lot of screeners like Dibbles that are assessing for phoneme segmentation. So I kind of get stuck in this 
phoneme seg, phoneme blending, back and forth cycle. But what the research is telling us is that the most effective and the most predictor, the biggest predictor for reading success are these advanced phonemic awareness skills over here. So sound deletion, substitution, and sound addition. And I just want to point out that these age ranges right here are where some of these skills start to typically develop. But for a lot of our students, these are not the ages where they are mastering these skills. And a lot of our students need this instruction for long after. These are just suggested ages, but you might have a second or third grader who's still working over here at the syllable level, or you might have older students who need some of this instruction as well. But this advanced phonemic awareness, these are the skills that are really crucial for becoming a fluent word reader over here. And there is a link in the math literacy guide. Um, it's from Reading Rockets. It's by Louisa Motz and Carol Tolman. And it is this phonological progression just written out in a different way. I borrowed Melissa Orkin's slides, but if you look at that link, it's going to give you a really nice layout of all of these skills for you. A couple of ways we can put this into our instruction. From the left here, these are slides. And I have to say, I call this Ufly, and I recently just learned that it's probably pronounced Ufly, so whatever you call it, we'll go with that. But this is from that website, the University of Florida Literacy Institute, that is linked on the guide and it's linked in the document that we've sent out to you. These are all made for you and they're really wonderful because what it is is Alconin boxes where you can have the students move the chips into the boxes for each sound. So, uh, and these are all done for you so that you can use them in a virtual setting, which has been really helpful for me this year because until recently, we've been entirely remote with our students. So having those already made has been a huge help. On the right is just a way that you can use the Alconin boxes in person. Uh, they're using Unifix tubes. You could use counters. You could use erasers, really whatever is at your disposal. Just keeping in mind, we're not going to use any print. This next slide, I'm going to give credit to one of my colleagues who put this into kind of a virtual format for me, and I thought it was brilliant, and so I've borrowed it. This activity, you could use it for rhyming, for syllables, for phonemes, whatever you feel like your students need. What you do is you would roll the dice. When it stops, the students would remove that box. I'm going to remove two just so that you can see. There's pictures in here, and they could, like I said, they could produce a rhyme. They could count the number of syllables. You could count the number of phonemes with them. And this translates really nicely into a classroom activity as well. So just another thing, my students love this. They call this the dice game. I wish it was something more creative, but they love it. So I just keep using it for lots of different skills that way. And another activity that is also from that Ufly Ufly website is the strings on a bead, which I love. They have them animated all for you. This is linked on the Mass Literacy Guide. And as you click, the beads will move. Again, you could count words, syllables, phonemes. This is a great multi-sensory activity. You could take this into the classroom too. The students could have beads on a string and it really gives them that kinesthetic experience with the phonemes. And down the bottom, this is a screen grab right from the Mass Literacy Guide that shows you where you can click to visit to get some of these activities for yourself. So free reading and again, the University of Florida Literacy Institute. And underneath are really wonderful videos that you can watch to see this in action. I haven't even watched all of them yet, but I'm still working my way through them. There are scripts that are made so that you can do some of these activities without having to think of some of the words, which is a big time saver again and other activities that you can do with your students. All right, I know I went fast. That was a lot of information, but we're going to move from phonological awareness into phonics and decoding right now. We just covered all of that phonological awareness and some of the great resources that you can find in the guide. As for phonics, I implement a systematic phonics routine into my, for me it's small groups, but this could be done in the classroom as well. There is a scope and sequence example on the math literacy guide for you of all of the phonics skills from simple to most complex. That comes from the letters program, which is from Louisa Motz and Carol Tolman. It's just an example. You could do this differently. There really isn't a formally accepted scope and sequence in the field of reading. They all are generally the same, but they might have a few differences. But that 
that letters one is a good place to start if you're looking to implement some of this into your instruction. Moving from words in isolation to connected text to give our students a chance to apply is going to be key. And then two mass literacy resources for you. One is a gradual release example and how you might use that in your explicit instruction for phonics. And another is a guide for effective phonics instruction from Joan Sedita at Keys to Literacy. She is a wealth of knowledge. And this guide also has many resources for instruction and more videos for you. We'll talk about some of those as well. This is another example of a phonics routine that I've adapted from the Barksdale Reading Institute that's also on the Mass Literacy Guide. You'll be able to find this and it breaks down the different components of a phonics routine in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna do that on the next slide, so I'm not gonna read all the way through this, but this is an example of how I would go about my phonics routine with my students just from beginning to end. And we'll walk through these steps. The first is addressing the sound symbol correspondence in some way. This card example, I just have access to the Wilson sound cards, but every program kind of has their own. And on the left is really important because it's showing the students how to form the sound appropriately, which is key, especially for our English language learners. A lot of these sounds might not exist in their first language. So being able to see the sound formed appropriately is going to be key for their understanding. And now we know, especially I'm in the classroom wearing a mask and so they can't see my mouth and these pictures or you can find videos have been really, really helpful for my students to be able to form the sound the right way. So that's the first part of the sound symbol correspondence. And from there, we would move into some type of coding. If you are familiar at all with Wilson, this is kind of like marking up. And I do this a little bit differently depending on the medium that I'm using for this setting. I've just underlined SH because it's a digraph that makes one sound. You could also show them the word and highlight a target phonics pattern. You just wanna be bringing their attention to where that phonics pattern is existing in words that they already know. From there, the third part is moving into a blending routine. This gives students the opportunity to practice blending and apply those phonics patterns in real words. And this is my virtual blending board that I have, but you don't have to get fancy. When I'm in person, I'm just usually writing on a whiteboard or a pen and paper. You could use letter cards on the board in front of you. You don't have to get crazy, but going through this blending routine with your students so they can learn how to apply it. And again, I have some pictures here just to provide support for my English language learners. I've used real photos just to give them something to connect to. I've changed one sound here, again, to give them some practice. And then also changing around where in the word that target phonics pattern is, if appropriate, just so they have the opportunity to practice this sound moving into different places. From there, oops, here we go. From there, we're moving into some interactive practice. And this could be embedded into different parts of your day. You don't have to sit and do all of this from beginning to end. And I'm still working on that. Sometimes in my small group, I really want to start with one and go all the way to the end, but I tend to run out of time. So where you can take these and practices and put them elsewhere, you know, wherever they can fit. But these are word chains, which I love and just did a little bit of that in the few slides before. But that means you're just changing one target sound at a time. And you can see an example of that over here. You could, again, whiteboard and marker, pencil and paper does just fine. That's how I prefer to do it. But you could also give them another multi-sensory opportunity by using magnet letters or word cards or letter, sorry, letter cards or letter tiles in some way. Students can also engage in word sorts. The Math Literacy Guide has a great link that has a lot of vowel team word sorts that are already made for you. That has been a great time saver for me to be able to take those word sorts and use them with my students. Just a precaution with word sorts that the students should really be engaged in actively reading the words for the word sorts to be effective. We all have those students that just sort all the words and then I say, okay, can you read it to me? And they can't read it yet. So if they're doing word sorts, just making sure that they're engaging in active reading. Another example of interactive practice. 
And you could always play some games. We love games. The, I work with the youngest students. Again, they think dice are super fun. So we do a lot of roll and reads on the Mass Literacy Guide from that University of Florida Literacy Institute. They have roll and reads that are already made for you, which is amazing. Just print and go or share screen and go. They have other activities and principles listed on there as well. And I've been doing a lot with this word wheel. This is from wheelofnames.com. It's super simple. You just type in all of the words and it spins. And we've been playing with the phonics that way as well. Once they're through with some interactive practice, you wanna move into some type of encoding routine to give the students practice. So a dictation or sound boxes. Alconin boxes are such a powerful tool. I didn't really realize how many different ways I could use them. And I think I'm still learning, you know, every single time I find a new way to do it or I see somebody else and I borrow their idea. When they're doing a dictation for this, they would write the letters that represent each phoneme into the sound boxes. You could also do this with actual letters or letter tiles. And there are a couple of excellent videos on the Mass Literacy Guide. I had never thought about doing my dictation this way and using the sound boxes for that. And then I saw the videos on the guide and I thought, oh, I'm already doing this with phonological and phonemic awareness. I should definitely use this for part of my dictation. So I've started doing it. And I think it really helps the students see how the sounds and the letters are connected could also use a pen and paper again, or a whiteboard and paper to do part of this dictation as well. And the last part of this is connected text. And by that, it could be the phrase level, it could be the sentence level, or it could be the paragraph level. And for this, I love decodable text. Decodable text is text that is 80 to 90% decodable, which means 80 to 90% of the words that are in the text are letter sound correspondences that the students have already been taught. And Melissa Orkin said this when I was listening to her last week. She said, you know, a sensible text really can't be 100% decodable. It just, it wouldn't make sense. So 80 to 90% is a pretty safe bet to give the students some practice with specific decoding skills. There is a webinar on the Mass Literacy Guide, Teaching with Decodable Text. It's from the 95% group, and it's a really excellent video that shows you how to implement decodable text in an authentic way to support your phonics instruction. So I definitely recommend checking out that webinar. And we also want to use appropriate prompting. This, for me, when I listened to Emily Hanford give her talk, was one of my oh my goodness, aha moments. And so when I say appropriate prompting, what we mean is we wanna move away from strategies that promote guessing because the research tells us that skilled readers attend to the letters and the sounds. So they're not using pictures, they're not guessing or skipping over words. So using appropriate prompting as part of your phonics routine I borrowed this bookmark from Pam Kastner. She has put together a number of wonderful resources. And this is basically just drawing the student's attention to the letters and the sound. So encouraging them to decode all of the words is the way that we wanna go when using decodable text. And finally, just some considerations for English learners again, because we know that decodable text, it might not be the most language rich text. And sometimes I'm reading it going, I don't know if this will work, but a couple of things you can do to make it more accessible for them, labeling the cover to be able to attach a visual to some of those words, and then introducing the vocabulary explicitly. So for example, in some of those early decodables, we see the word map pop up over and over again, and they might not know that what we mean is rug. So introducing that ahead of time, and I've linked on the document for you a resource where you can find lots of decodable text because sometimes we don't have them at our disposal. So you should be able to find some through that. I've been using a lot of wonderful free resources online for now just to support my instruction that way. This is an example of a decodable text that you might use for that target SH digraph. And you can tell just by looking at it that we're working on the SH digraph and closed syllables. So this is an example of a text that you might use to support that skill. All right, so finally, we've gone from phonological awareness. We've looked through some of those phonics and decoding resources. And just briefly, we're gonna talk about automatic word recognition because that's really the end goal. So 
So for automatic word recognition, we want to use practices that promote orthographic mapping, which basically means we want to focus on the phoneme grapheme connection. When in doubt, go back to the letters and the sounds. And if you're looking for more information on orthographic mapping, which is the process by which we store words for an automatic retrieval, we there are tons of resources on the math literacy guide. And I went through and pulled out my favorite ones for you from articles to videos. But if you want more information on what this is and how it applies to building proficient readers, definitely check out those links because I still feel like I'm learning a lot about this. I'm not sure I, I fully understand the science behind this yet, but I'm using those articles and those videos to, to help me with that. One of the ways that I do this is by using the heart word strategy, which comes from really great reading. When I would teach high frequency words in my small groups, I used to structure my lessons, you know, Monday, I would do an echo, say like a flashcard, Tuesday, we might whisper, say it. Wednesday, we might skywrite it. And what I found was for my students that didn't yet understand this process, the concept of remembering a word as, it, as a whole was really abstract for them. And they didn't really have anything to grab onto when they got to that word in the text. So they had no word attack skills for that. And so we all have those students, you know, you've shown them the word the 2,500 times and they still don't know the word the. So this is a alternative to sort of that flashcard method that I just started working on and I'm still refining this year and learning a lot about it, but it's a way to build automaticity and the student's sight word lexicon. Essentially what you're doing is you're going to say the word orally first, identify the number of phonemes in the word, again showing them maybe some sound boxes, you're gonna write the letters for the word in those sound boxes, and then have a discussion about which parts are irregular versus regular parts of the word. And that's where that heart comes in. You know, That's the part of the word where they have to know by heart. I was surprised to learn that most words in English, I believe it's something like 80 to 90% of words are only irregular by one phoneme or one sound symbol correspondence. So what this is doing is giving my students something to anchor onto to be able to decode or try to attack the word when they get to it in the text. And it's made a huge difference for me. And the math literacy guide has videos and there's a link to an irregular word section where you can find more strategies for teaching these high frequency words and getting them into students sight word bank. Back just to give us an overview again and, and wrap our heads around what we just talked about, but we focused on the fluent word reading side. We went through phonological awareness, some phonics and decoding, and then how both of those funnel into automatic word recognition, which is one strand of Scarborough's reading rope. And finally, this is one of my favorite quotes by Anita Archer. There is no comprehension strategy powerful enough to compensate for the fact that you can't read the words. For me, you know, especially with so many students that still struggle to read, this is a really powerful quote. Um, still learning every single day. I feel like I still need to pick apart some of this guide myself, but I've also put my email here and it's at the bottom of the hyperlink document that was sent out. If you have any questions or you want any resources, feel free to shoot me an email. I can't promise that I'll know the answer, but I will try to find the answer for you and get back to you if I know it. I'm happy to share anything and everything that I talked about today. So please don't hesitate to send me an email and I will do my best to support you. Or if you have any other fabulous ideas, I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you as well. So. Thank you so much, Donna and Susan. I'll stop sharing now. And that was that was just wonderful. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. You gave everyone so much to think about. I actually want to take one quick moment before you and Susan move into your um, question and answer segment, just to remind everyone, because we had in the chat going on so many questions about the link uh, that you had your beautiful sheet and we've provided a larger link sheet. But I did want to remind everyone that everything that you referenced today, all of the work that you showed in some of these favorite picks that you had were all on the skills for early, they're clickable via the skills for early reading page right here. You went into phonological awareness, phonics and decoding and automatic word recognition. So if people were not to have that sheet anymore or misplace it, they can go to the mass literacy guide and, and like you go in, start clicking around, read, learn, view, 
tryout materials, um, but I just wanted to reassure everyone that they were there as well. Yeah, um, and the guide is laid out nicely. You, it's, it's hard to get into too much of a deep dive away from that landing page, so it's pretty straightforward, and, and they're all in there, I promise, <laughs> every single one. No, you really did. You gave us so much to consider because there's a lot of pieces involved in supporting the development of fluent word reading. Um, we're going to take a couple of minutes now and allow you and Susan to have some question and answer time. So I'm going to pass the mic over to my DESE colleague, Susan Kazeroid. She's also a content lead at DESE, and she was deeply involved in the development of the Mass Literacy Guide. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Donna. And thank you so much, um, Jennifer. You gave us so much to think about. Um, so much to take back. And so my first question is for, for those of us who might be feeling a little overwhelmed um, with um, you know, thinking about where do we start with phonological awareness? Where do we start with phonics and decoding? Where do we start with automatic word recognition? Um, we had a question, I was wondering if you might take a minute to kind of um, go through each of those three areas and give a suggestion as to just where to start. Absolutely. So I would say where I would start with phonological awareness, and this is where I started while I was wrapping my head around all of this, because I agree there's so much information and it's really overwhelming to try to figure out not only what am I missing, what don't I know, but also how do I, how do, I do this, how do I apply it? But for phonological awareness, I would just start with not not cutting it out, so doing something. So definitely visit the Mass Literacy Guide and take a look, find your favorite activity. You know, you could start, depending on your grade level, start off with some rhyming. See if your students can produce rhymes and then go from there. You could also segment sounds. I think that's a pretty straightforward activity um, that is assessed very often, but you could go through, I think, and start anywhere you want with that. It can't hurt them. So anything you're doing, I think is gonna be beneficial. As for phonics, I think this again, it depends on what your students need, but one major takeaway for me, I'll kind of combine the automatic word recognition with phonics, but trying to use some decodable text, I think in instruction is a really powerful tool because it supports our students in being able to apply the phonics. And then also the more they're decoding, the quicker they're getting some of these word and symbol correspondences into their sight word vocabulary. So anything you can find for phonological awareness and squeezing in a little decodable text to support your phonics is gonna be really powerful, I think. And that's where I started, <laughs> so. Great, thank you. And any suggestions for automatic word recognition for people who don't have as much experience there? Again, I think I shared that bookmark from uh, Pam Kastner, which is amazing, but I think if we can be promoting our students to use strategies, the way that they're getting these words into their automatic lexicon, their automatic sight word, is by decoding them and by attending to the letters and the sounds. And that's a combination of the phonological awareness and the phonics. But if they're reading, promoting those strategies that are allowing them to really work through, and it can be, you have to give the wait time. You know, for me, uh, sometimes I'm sitting there going, oh, should I be jumping in? And then right when I think it, the student says the word, right? So giving them the opportunity to practice, the more decoding opportunities they have to work through it on their own, the faster that word is going to get to be automatic for them. So really giving them that opportunity to attend to that. Thank you. We have a question. Um, what are some free resources for uh, decodable text? Um, text. Oh, that's a great question. So if you have a pencil, I'll, I'll start firing them down or maybe someone can pop some in the chat for me. One of my favorites that is still free, I believe until June of this year are Spire Decodables, S-P-I-R-E. Those are right on their website. It goes all the way from CVC to multisyllabic words. Those are excellent books. Um, I've also found some books from Think Central. They call them grade kindergarten and grade one, but I've been using some even with my third graders. So again, it just depends on your students. And you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been using Flyleaf a lot as well. And I don't know if they still have those free or not, but at one point they were. And those are really engaging online as well because they turn like a real book, which my students have loved. Yep. Um, let's see. Um, 
Are you using in Lynn, are you using Hegarty at all? There's some um, questions around Hegarty. We are not using Hegarty yet. There's been some talk about going there. We are fortunate that our core reading program that we have, which is a National Geographic program, does incorporate phonological awareness every single day into instruction from K to two. I don't know yet if that's going to be enough for our students. So we are lucky to have the early grades literacy grant at my school too, and be able to have some extra funds to go that way. It's something that's in the works, and I think we'll end up we'll end up going there just to give our students some more support. But I've heard wonderful things about it. I don't know a lot about it. Some of you are probably experts in it, um, but I've heard nothing but good things. So great, thank you. And just to let our participants know that on the link sheet that is in the handouts are also um, some examples of decodable text and I believe Catherine dropped the link um, from the mass literacy guide where we also have um, some links to free decodable text. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Donna and Catherine I'm going to give you the opportunity we don't have any more questions and we have just a couple minutes left so I just wanted to reach out to the two of you and see if there's anything that you would like um, to ask Jen. Actually, Susan, I think it is um, perfect timing for us to be able to transition and make sure that we give all of our um, attendees time to know a, you know a couple of announcements in advance of next week's session and for them to also get the survey link. So if, if that's okay, maybe we could Sure, great, on. thank you, Jen, so much. Thank you. You guys are letting me off the hook. Thank you so much. <laughs> nice job, ladies. Really appreciate it. Before we do close, as we're bumping right up against um, the end of our time, two really quick reminders. First, be sure to check out this top resources page here within the Mass Literacy Guide. It's right at the landing page for videos of previous Mass Literacy webinar sessions. Uh, today's will be posted within the next week or so. Secondly, we do have a one pager that has been developed that offers ways to access the guide. Links to both of these, the top resources, as well as the getting started with the mass literacy support page are in the links document and are being, drop, being dropped in the chat for you right now. Before we close, um, I also just want to be sure to ask you to take a few minutes to complete the brief survey that we have so we can be more responsive. The link was just dropped into the chat for you. You may wanna click on it now so you could have it and do it later on. However, you'll also receive a survey reminder email with the link in it within about 24 hours and you can complete it that way if you would prefer. We really appreciate your being here today and special thanks to Jen for sharing so much and making the Mass Literacy Guide come alive so much. Uh, we hope you can all join us on next Thursday, March 18th at 3.30 for our session on language comprehension. And that's shown right there. Lastly, if you have any further questions or comments, please submit them in the Mass Literacy Contact Us box. A link to that box is in the resource document and that also is being dropped in the chat right now. We appreciate your time. Thank you for being here with us today. Don't forget to join us next Thursday, March 18th at 3.30 for the session on language comprehension. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you and take care everybody. Bye-bye.